introductions. So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this POSI online talk. So this is Ricky from POSI. I'm currently acting as a general secretary. So this is our 24th POSI talk. So every weekend, uh, every week uh, since COVID-19, we have a new POSI talk. And we have post all of our uh, video in YouTube channels. So first of all, we want to thanks to Nobel Resource uh, for sp sponsoring this FOSI Zoom platform since the beginning of uh, FOSI Talk. And then tonight, we are very honored to have uh, Professor Mitchell Morsili. He's a very well-known expert of carbon arts. So this is very interesting talk. We will talk about the internal wave. Uh, I think this is some new topics from some of us, yeah, uh, including me also. <laughs> so this is a very interesting talk. And I hope you can enjoy this, yeah. Uh, before I, I hand over to Morsili, there are some rules about this meeting, yeah. First, you need to mute the audio and video during the presentations to maintain a good connections. And the second one, if you want to have, to have a questions later on, please write your name, yeah, at the chat box. And the third one, uh, we will record the sessions for FOSI YouTube and we will post it later because some people cannot attend the, um, during this, this meeting, yeah? And they can enjoy uh, the video at the YouTube channel. So <clears throat> I think that's all from me. We are very honored to have more silly and I hope you enjoy the talk. So now we don't further ado, please welcome our speaker, Mr. Uh, Mitchell Morsili. Your time, Pat. Uh, Morsili, uh, I think you mute, you mute your audio. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. You, you can start your talk. Okay. Thank you very much for this invitation and welcome to everyone. Uh, so my talk is about the internal waves and their impact on carbon systems and with some example on the modern and also in the ancient. Uh, I don't know how many people are aware about the internal waves. And uh, what I'm sure that you already know very well some uh, oceanic processes like the turbidites, like the contourites, and maybe there are some strange things like the Ekman transport or uh, other, um, other features that you can see in the ocean. But what about the internal waves? I'm quite sure that uh, many of you uh, are, are aware about the internal waves because we know very well the surface waves, the storms, the effect on sediments, but I think that in the, in the literature is not very well constrained the role of the internal waves, that they are waves gravity waves that oscillate within a fluid medium. In fact, the internal waves arise from the perturbation of the hydrostatic equilibrium, where the balance is maintained between the force of gravity and the buoyant restoring force. So what is interesting is that the internal waves are not visible from the surface because they occur below the sea surface. In fact, when you have a stratified fluid with two different density, you can create this kind of internal waves. For this reason, they call internal because are inside the ocean. And they are, and they are also not only in the ocean, but also in the lake. So any waters with some stratification can develop the internal waves. So in this small movie over here, you can see the sea surface on this part and then the oscillation like the, the gravity, gravity waves. So where they propagate, the internal waves propagate along the picrocline, which is the picrocline, is just the interface between two different density fluids and they occur also in uh, lakes and ocean. So the picnocline, uh, the most common know is the thermocline related to the temperature. And the picnocline in the stratified ocean, like today, we have 
two types of peak decline, the permanent and also the seasonal. Uh, what is important for a sedimentologic point of view is that the depth of the peak decline is highly variable, both in permanent and seasonal. And uh, in open ocean, it mostly varies with latitude and also varies through the years as a surface weather temperature changes. In fact, this is like a section of the Atlantic Ocean from uh, south to north, and you can see that the, the thermocline in this case, related to the temperature, is highly variable in depth, from some uh, very deep part to shallow part. And, uh, this affects the stratification of the ocean, but it is also important to consider that there is a seasonal thermocline or picnocline, and they vary during the months from uh, like in the northern hemisphere in the, in the Atlantic, you have from March to August, there is a very big difference. And then also the depth of the picnocline can be very variable. In this case, from 20, 25 meters in almost, up to 100 meters in March and January. So this is important because they, this is, have a very big impact in the continental shelf, but also in some place along the, the continental slope because the, the picnic line can be deeper than this example. So, but if we have a stratified fluid with two different density, what we need is a, a perturbation of the equilibrium. So the internal waves are commonly excited by tides. They are very frequent, by storms also, and uh, uh, also wind stress and atmospheric pressure fluctuation can be very important in uh, generate this kind of perturbation. So also very rare, but also tsunamis can be a uh, trigger mechanism, as well as turbidic flow, river plumps, and also in some case they are documented by the submarines because usually they uh, they travel at the picnocline interface. So, we cannot see from the, from the sea surface the internal waves, but if you have some radar image from satellite, you can observe the difference between the surface waves that usually the wavelength are very short, very small, compared to the internal waves. This is the Andaman Sea. You can see the huge wavelength of these internal waves detected from the radar image from the satellite. And what is important to note, to note how the scale is very, very big. So between one crest and the other crest of the internal waves, you have about five kilometers. So this is nothing compared to the surface wave where the wavelength is very, very short compared to the internal waves. There are many, many examples all around the world. So I select just few to make sure that they are completely different from the sea surface, uh, so from the wave surface. And here, this is the Red Sea between the Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And you can see the, the, the crest of the internal waves detected from the radar image of here. This is uh, close to your country, not very far away. And usually the internal waves, they propagate in packets. They are close together and they are called the solitons. But this is not uh, really important for uh, sedimentologists, but mostly for oceanographers. And uh, how we can detect the internal waves? So usually we use some mooring and then we can measure the difference in temperature time by time. In fact, in this image, this is not a, a real internal wave, it's just the fluctuation of temperature in one place in different time. So in this, in this case, you can reconstruct the 
fluctuation, the temperature fluctuation through time, and then you can detect the presence of internal waves with a different time period between one oscillation and the other one. So there are, in many places, they recognize these kind of internal waves. In fact, also in, with the acoustic backscatter, you can also see the distribution of the krills. Oh, here, these small shrimps, where they are feeding for the waves. Oh, here, you can observe the wave shape of these internal waves. And uh, also the internal waves, when they propagate, they are responsible for the mixing of the water. This is an, another important effect on nutrient and organisms, as well as in the temperature mixing of the, of the ocean. And uh, so internal waves are quite common. And they are common as the waves at the sea surface, and perhaps even more. And they are very widely in amplitude, period, speed, and depth. In fact, if you consider this, uh, this map, uh, this is the internal waves observed from uh, 2002 and uh, 2004, so in two years, and there are many places they are very well studied, but there are places that they are not yet very well constrained, but they are a lot. In fact, another important mechanism to trigger the internal waves are the tides. And uh, in this case, the internal waves with tidal frequency are called internal tides. And they are generated as the surface tides and move stratified water up and down, sloping topography, and particularly in submarine canyons, seamounts, and slopes. So they are everywhere in the world. In fact, there is a, some a nice example. This is a numerical simulation of the internal tides generated in the Strait of Gibraltar. Over here, you can see that the Mediterranean uh, waves and uh, tides, they push the water over here. There is an enlargement over here. And uh, here, the energy increase with the raising the tide and accumulates in the in this seal, and then they start to propagate and dissipate the energy as internal waves of here. So, and they are very fast. And the speed can be about 1.5 to 2 meters per second. So, this is a nice example. But if we consider what happens worldwide, so there are internal tides all around the world. And you can see in the Atlantic Ocean, you can see in the Indian Ocean, and you can see also in the Pacific. So yeah, there are places that where they are very, very strong, and this depends on the sea bottom topography, and in other places are very weak. But still, this is a very important mechanism to be considered. Okay, how big are the internal waves? So the amplitude can be very, very variable from few centimeters to more than 300 meters. Can you imagine how big are these internal waves? So just to compare, Maybe you can see uh, these, these tall buildings. The most famous maybe was the Empire State Building, but I put also some building in your country. Maybe you know, I never been over there, so for me it's, uh, it's quite new, but the, 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 the size is more or less uh, close to the the biggest waves, internal waves, detected in, in the world. So, they are very, very strong. They are very big and they can... Other oh, example, this is uh, also in New York place, in the Lombok Straits, where they are detected uh, internal waves with a wavelength of 1.8 kilometers and uh, 
eight of the waves about 100 meters so quite huge big one and uh, the depth is between they are confined between 25 meters uh, through 200 and something in depth so quite huge with a speed detected the speed is 1.5 meter per second per uh, second the biggest internal waves detected until now are between taiwan and the luzon so in this area there are very very huge internal waves so what is important for sedimentologists? Because if they propagate in the open ocean, for us are not very well interesting, no? But the problem is that they propagate in the open ocean, but they reach the continental slope and also the continental shelf. So for this reason, the internal waves, they act like the surface wave in fact if you consider the, the the behavior of the gravity waves when they there is some interference with the sea bottom the the wave shape change and then you can have also the breaking like in the surface wave in fact this this figure is related to the surface wave but if you imagine the breaking inside the ocean in internal part of the ocean so you can have different type of uh, internal waves breaking and this is related to the inclination of the continental slope or continental shelf so we can have very different type of breaking so why is important important the breaking because the, the breaking can have some impact on sediment and we are sedimentologists and for us it's very important to know what happens if you have some internal waves breaking over a continental shelf or slope. So this is a nice example and a direct observation on, on echogram in St. Lawrence history in Quebec, Canada and here you can see the shape of internal waves and then when there is a shoaling of the waves the crest and the wavelength is reducing and then at the end we have the breaking with some effect on the continental shelf okay this is a numerical simulation made by a friend uh, daniel borgo in quebec in canada and uh, he demonstrate how to create a bottom stress and with some erosion of the seas, uh, sea bottom sediments and then an upslope and also sometimes the downslope movement of the sediments. In this case you can see the upslope movement of the sediments related to the breaking of the internal waves but there is also some downflow related to the density of the sediment. In this case, uh, he modeled some muddy sediments, but if you have a more uh, coarser sediments like sand, you can create also hyperpycnal flow or turbididic flow because the, the, the density is more higher than the fluid below this part. In this case, you just create a nephloid layer because the density is more or less close to the peak line. So this is interesting because you can have some currents upslope and also downslope of the sediments. So you create the bidirectional movements of sediments. In fact, the current associated with the internal waves are often large enough to scar the seafloor and resuspend the bottom sediments in the breaking zone. Both upslope and downslope and the internal waves and induced currents provide an asymmetrical mechanism for onshore to offshore sediment, sediments reworking. Uh, the, the induced current they are measured up to 70 centimeters per second but in more recent uh, study 
they also detect some one meter per second. So this is uh, quite enough to remove from the sea bottom silt, sand, and also some small uh, gravel. In this case, you have the entertainment and then the transportation of this kind of sediments. So it is very, very important to consider the presence of the internal waste. The, the simple mechanism is this one, no? Uh, when the sediments move absorbed by the brakes, uh, partly in su suspension, you have the braking, the bottom uh, stress, they create a suspension with a, a wash run up and upflow movement of the sediments. Then the return flow mixed with fluid between breakers and move the sediments down slope as bed load. This is equivalent to the backwash uh, on the sea surface on the beach. And then the, uh, the next uh, breaking of internal base create uh, another turbulence and sediment erosion, transport the position under repetitive high energy events. It was uh, a uh, very old experiment uh, by my Southern Cacione in 1973, and they had the same, the same results. So, if we are able to remove sediments from the sea bottom, and we are able also to transport upslope and downslope with some unidirectional flow, and also if we have some wave, some oscillatory flow, so we can make some consideration about some sedimentary structures that they are commonly uh, thought uh, like related to the storm, to the surface storm waves. So the Amoki cross stratification. I'm quite sure that you are very familiar with this kind of sedimentary structure. This is a like considered like a diagnostic uh, sedimentary structures and but uh, what we if you go in the literature there are some debate about the formation and uh, uh, the formation of this uh, kind of uh, sedimentary structure so what we proposed uh, uh, some years ago with uh, Luis Pomar is that the amok cross stratification can be explained also with the influence of internal ways. In fact, they satisfactorily explain the occurrence of Amoki cross stratification in different depositional environments. They are detected also in lake and the wide range of bathymetric position and also the required flow regime like unidirectional and oscillatory flow. So the, the simple mechanism is this one, no? with the breakers of internal waves, you have resuspension sediments, uh, erosion, rip up class, then you have the backwash uh, with solmark structures, nephaloid layer, and uh, in the last phase you have oscillatory flow, that can modify the sediments on the sea bottom. And this can explain why we have the planar lamination, the amoki cross stratification, as well as also the swallow and ripples over here. So this is a, another example that maybe we are not sure again, but we are studying about this uh, kind of sedimentary structures. The, they detected some years ago in the turbidites, so in, the, in deep water, some amoki-like cross stratification. And uh, to, to create this kind of structure in a deep water, you need both unidirectional flow, like this is very common in turbidic currents, but you have also some oscillatory flow. And uh, in some experiments in the laboratory, they also demonstrate how the turbidic currents can create and trigger some internal waves if there are some water stratification, some difference in density. So another uh, uh, very recent uh, published in 2015 uh, about the very common sand waves along the continental shelf or slope in some uh, main part of the oceans, they detected the huge sand waves 
And uh, in this paper, they also uh, interpreted this kind of uh, sedimentary structures as related to the internal waves. So, what about uh, internal waves and carbonate systems? I have some consideration about the, the carbonate system before to, to show you some example. And uh, so you know very well uh, that these uh, real, mostly in tropical settings, they are mostly studied over there. And this is the classical models of James, uh, the subtidal carbonate factory. Uh, and this is re related to the modern type of carbonate production. So this, if you go in every place in tropical realm, the mostly common uh, production of carbonate sediments, skeletal components mostly, are in the, in the very shallow water. And then along the slope and in the basin, we have just some uh, buzzing world transport of the sediments uh, created on the margin of the inner, inner platform. So, but the problem is that uh, if we go in the stratigraphic record, we have a very huge variety of carbonate platforms and mostly also about the phases distribution inside this kind of uh, geometrical shape like ramps, shelves, and carbonate platforms. So uh, the simple model of James, maybe it's not enough to explain why we have such kind of very huge difference in phases distribution and the uh, geometrical depositional profile. And in fact, if you consider that the internal architecture of carbonate system, carbonate platforms are related to some interaction between internal and external controlling factors like we have to consider in carbonates the biological evolution and we have to consider the climate change we have to consider also the configuration of the paleogeography all these factors influence what a lot of the geometrical features like the diverse depositional profile and facies belt, and uh, the, as the results of different types of carbonate platforms. So if they are uh, related to the biological evolution, what we have to consider, we have to consider all the factors that influence the organisms, the biota, as the temperature, the oxygen, uh, nutrients, salinity, and so on. So, if we consider this complex uh, pattern of interaction, we can explain much better the difference in types and geometrical and phases uh, of the carbonate platforms. So, are important internal waves in carbonate systems? Yes, of course, as in transporting sediments, but also they influence also the the biota, the, the organisms, the skeletal components of the carbon systems. In fact, in carbonate, the internal waves can influence both the sediment remobilization and carbon producing biota. And the internal waves also influence the nutrient, the plankton, the larval distribution, while inducing thermal variation by vertical displacement of the thermocline. There are some, uh, there are many, many examples, uh, mostly by marine biologists, about the coral reefs, uh, how they influence the, 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 the coral reefs production in the shallow sea. And the internal waves have a very huge effect in the nutrient, but also in the thermal variation of the, of the reef. In fact, up here, this is an example from South China Sea, recently published, and here the internal waves are mostly on the reef slope below 40, 50 meters, but they induce currents up slope. They can influence the nutrients that reach 
the reef crest, but also in the, in the reef flood, you can have some influence, both of nutrient, but also in the temperature. They drop drastically, abruptly, the temperature. In fact, there is another uh, very uh, nice uh, recent example. Uh, they detect in Palau a drop in the temperature about uh, 50, uh, 57 meters depth of 12 degrees in one minute. So it means that you pass from, uh, I don't know, uh, 22 degrees to 10 degrees in a very, very short time. And this is a very, very uh, stress for the carbonate system, for the biota that lives over there. And, uh, but this drop in temperature is very, very important because can help some coral reefs to the bleaching uh, problems, no? Like uh, here in the Andaman Sea in Thailand, they study this site where the bleaching uh, was very important in some, uh, in some season, but the presence of internal waves and the related the temperature drop, they can help to the reef to survive to very high temperature. In fact, this is uh, just published in, uh, in uh, Natural Research, this scientific uh, report is about that the internal tides, that they are internal waves of the tides frequency, can provide thermal refugia that will buffer some coral reefs from future global warming. You know that the global warming is very, very important in this time, and uh, maybe the internal waves can help some coral reefs to survive also if the temperature will increase in the next future. So, and there are also a, another uh, uh, important things that uh, when you have the breaking of internal waves, you can create a mixing of the water. And if you have some uh, warm and uh, with low oxygen in the, in the shallowest part of the, of the, of the reef, the mixing effect can bring some, uh, some oxygen, some water with different, with different uh, uh, oxygenation. So uh, there are some examples also in the modern that the, 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 the carbonate buildups are not related just to the shallowest part. We have some uh, coral buildups, or, or better, not corals, mix uh, red algae, rhodolites, uh, biplast, alimida, and other kind uh, of foraminifera of, of, uh, in, uh, in some place, they built in a, a water depth like uh, 40 to 60 meters. This is an example in your country close to the Macan Delta and where uh, these carbonate buildups, they grow where? Where there is the thermocline and where is the effect of nutrient mixing and internal waste breaking. So the internal waste can be also very important in uh, this uh, kind of communities. There is uh, also another example in uh, offshore of Australia where some uh, bright zone uh, mounds, they are in green in, the, in this picture. So they grow between 200 and 400 meters of water depth. And if you consider the position of these bright zone mounds, they are related to the thermocline. The thermocline in this area is exactly at the same place. So what it means? means that for have some mounts and some nutrients, you need some currents, some turbulence, and uh, the internal waves are the best candidate to explain this kind of mount. And uh, if we go deeper in the ocean, there are many uh, coral communities. They are not with zocks and tail, so they don't need uh, light in this part, but they need nutrients. To survive, they need some turbulence. And also over here, 
if you consider the great occurrence of these uh, deep water coral mounds, they occur mostly close to the permanent thermocline. And over here, we have internal waves and then currents and nutrients and whatever that you can explain and interpret the presence of these uh, deep water coral mounds with the presence of internal waves. So, and uh, over here, so we don't have too much time uh, to spend in some uh, example. They are mostly already published. And then I will give you some uh, reference at the end uh, of the talk. And uh, so just uh, a, a step back in the, in the presentation about the subtidal carbonic factory. Now, this is uh, okay, this works very well for modern type of carbonic system. But if you go in the past, we know that there are different type of carbonic platforms, carbonic systems, and there are some different biota. They can produce sediments also at different depth from the shallowest part, but also in the deeper part. So if we just make uh, uh, this uh, apparently complicated uh, slide about the light, because mostly of the organisms are photosynthetic or are related to some photosynthesis. And uh, if we consider the light penetration in the, in the, in the sea, in the ocean, so we have a, a very good light penetration, they call the euphotic zone. There is a, a zone, a deeper zone with uh, um, uh, a less light penetration. This is called usually mesophotic to oligophotic zone. And then we have also a dysphotic zone where there is no light or the light it's very very low and uh, the organisms uh, are not good where to thrive in this area. So uh, usually in the modern the euphotic zone is uh, the zone where the coral sleeps but also the seagrass related organisms like the epibetic foraminifera. If you go in the deeper there is uh, the mesophotic to oligophotic zone where the red algae they live very well in this condition, also if they live in the shallowest part. And then uh, if you go deeper, maybe you have some production of carbonates by the organisms not related to the light. Like the, if you remember the bryozoan in the offshore of, of uh, Australia. So, if we consider that we have a different light penetration and then we can have some production of organisms also in the meso-oligophotic zone, we can have some very power powerful tooling carbonate sedimentology. So we can use the different skeletal components as a tool to infer the paleodepth of the different system that we are studying. So, for the, this reason, we applied this concept in many, many examples uh, all around the, the world, mostly in Europe. And uh, so what we, we saw that there are some evidence that internal waves can explain much better uh, the presence of some coral uh, or um, coral microbial mounds uh, or other kind of carbonate platform uh, all around the world. Uh, I selected uh, in this talk just for, for time a problem. We have just one hour, I think, that I will finish uh, earlier. It's better for you that uh, you don't to have to stay too much on the screen. And uh, so the select uh, example are in the upper Jurassic in Spain and Italy. Uh, an example of uh, using coral buildups related to the uh, to a delta system, and then uh, oligocene coral buildups in Italy, in the northern Italy, and then I selected just one example with loose sediments. Loose sediments means uh, not 
organism attached to the substrate. So in this case, they are large benthic foraminifera and red algae. So the first example is in, uh, in Spain, in the central part uh, of the Spain. And uh, during the Jurassic, the situation, of course, the, pal the paleogeographic geography was very, very different uh, with a shallow sea in the, in the Iberian, uh, close to the Iberian Massif. Of here, there was an ocean of here. And uh, so what we do in the field is to make some very, very detailed map of this area to observe the distribution of coral microbial mounds along a transect. This transect uh, uh, is uh, more or less in deep direction. So it means uh, shallow water in the left side and uh, more deep water in the right side of the, of the figure, of the picture. And uh, where they are concentrated, the mounds? The mounds are concentrated mostly in this interval, in the mid part, and with some uh, uh, very small, uh, they, are, they are like uh, knobs, not very big mounds. And uh, this is the, the shape of this system with the coral my microbial in this part. And also there is a different geometrical organization of the sediments shaded by the, the mounds. They are more concentrated in this side, so means up deep and less in this part down deep. If you consider all the components of the coral and also other organisms associated to this kind of coral buildups, so what we can infer that the different uh, composition and also the organization on the leeward side to the, uh, to the other side, that the mostly interpretation, the mostly correct interpretation is that these mounds are not related to the surface wave, to the storm, storm waves, but the internal waves can better explain the geometrical feature as well as the components inside this kind of, uh, of mounds. Uh, another example we studied in, the, in Spain, in the Pyrenees, is about the, uh, a delta system, siliciclastic delta, but uh, the strange thing is that we have some coral buildups up to 50 meters in, in eight inside the prodelta clay. This is a quite uh, unusual system because usually the, the corals, they need the clear water, they don't need too much uh, nutrients, but in this case we demonstrate how this kind of a system can thrive also in the more nutrient-rich waters. But we need some mechanism to explain this kind of coral buildups because they are not close to the sea level because they are inside the prodelta clays and the prodelta is not in the shallowest part of the delta system. The shallowest part of the delta system is the delta front sands, as usually I'm sure that you know this system very well. And uh, so these uh, are some biomes, uh, and they are occur as biostroms, so stratified uh, interval. And this is the reconstruction. We did a very careful mapping in field. And uh, this is the coral buildup up to 50 meters or more in some case. And then there is a very nice asymmetrical distribution of the phages. So in green, you can see the mostly the coral are very rich, but they pass very abruptly to the clay. The clay in this case is the gray uh, the gray color, and time to time we have some coral radstone, we have some uh, pegstone, but also some sandstone that comes uh, from the delta front. And the asymmetrical distribution, as well as the skeletal components in radstone and pegstone, they derive it only from the buildup. 
So they don't have any influence from the shallowest part of the system. So it means that you need some turbulence in the deep, relatively deep water, not very deep, maybe 40, 50, 60, I don't know, meters of here that they can bring just and affect only the coral buildups. If you have surface storm, so you can remix, you can resuspend also the shallowest part of the system. But in this case, you, you have a reworking only of the deep part of the system. And uh, uh, the asymmetrical distribution of the phases can be related to the internal waves occurrence that they bring nutrients, they also create turbulence, and also they are effective in different phases organization with the asymmetrical shape of the coral buildups, uh, as well as also the leeward side distribution of different type of sediment, mostly skeletal paxton. So, if we change area, uh, we go in uh, southern Italy, uh, there is an upper Jurassic system. Uh, this is uh, the Italy, so this is the spur of the Italian boot. And this is also the place where I was born. I was born in a small town called Ischitella, over here. And I know very well this area because I did my PhD, my master thesis, so I worked a lot on this area and uh, what we know of here that the, the, the margin of the carbonate platform uh, in this age in the upper Jurassic was made by stromatoporoid spongy. They are like a sponges and uh, this kind of organism are quite common. They encrust, uh, they grow and uh, they form a very strange system that is not uh, nothing comparable to the modern one, are not like the coral reefs. And uh, if you consider the various components of, of this kind of system, uh, what we did is to study carefully all the components and we found that mostly the, these kind of, uh, of mounds are not related to the shallow water. The components are mostly from the meso to oligophotic zone. So it means that we don't have a system influenced by surface wave storm, but we have the presence of reworking of sediments. We need anyway some turbulence, some nutrients, and for this reason the interpretation for the system is also that we can better explain the presence of these stromatopoid rich buildups with the presence of internal waves. Uh, another example uh, in Italy, in the northern Italy, uh, is the Colibericci system. And uh, this is a Oligocene, so quite recent Cenozoic uh, system uh, that was interpreted like a classical barrier reef with a, a reef uh, on the rim and then a shelf lagoon and whatever. So we did some very careful and detailed study in the outcrop and uh, also considering the different type of components that they are related to the light penetration, we differentiate between euphotic, mesophotic and oligophotic components and the stratigraphic logs uh, measured in this area, they show that there are some fluctuation between more abundant euphotic shallow water components, and then we have some relatively deep water components in the meso-oligophotic zone, and then again, so a sort of uh, transgressive to regressive cycles, if you prefer, in this way. What is uh, very, very nice that on here there are some corals, uh, buildups uh, or mounds, the, the, the size is very small. So what is important that the corals are not related to the very shallow water components, but they are 
mostly in the meso oligophotic system. So what means? Means that we have the simple sedimentary models where the, the, the corals, they don't build up to the sea level like in the model, but they thrived mostly in the meso oligophotic zone. In fact, the shallowest part of the system was the seagrass related environments. And in the deep part of the system, they, they, there were some large benthic foraminifera, like nummulites, quite common during the years. So, uh, also in this case, internal ways can better explain why we have this kind of system in the not in the shallowest part, but in the deeper meso to oligophotic zone. Uh, another example studied by Luis Pomar and, and other co-workers uh, is in uh, subsurface. In this case, we are offshore in Venezuela, where there is a, a depositional model for oligocene system, where we don't have uh, coral reefs of here, uh, there are mostly loose sediments made by mostly red algae, different type of red algae like uh, or rhodolites uh, or branching or whatever. Uh, and then also a lot of large benthic foraminifera. Uh, according to the type of different components, carbonate components of the system, so what we have here that the red algae are in uh, oligophotic zone uh, and also the, uh, the foraminifera, the large bent foraminifera are in the deepest part of the system. Instead, in the upper part, in the shallowest part uh, of, this, uh, of this ramp, we have the seagrass related organism and some branching corals, but they are mostly fragments, not the real coral reefs. So the system is mostly a loose sediments, and uh, this is uh, the building blocks architecture uh, where you have a transgression and then a regress regressive cycles, and you can record in the in the wells, in the core wells, uh, the the evolution of the system. So if we consider the depositional models according to the components, the skeletal components. Uh, Inside the system, we have the seagrass dominated area, we have a red algae dominated area, and then we have the large benthic foraminifera area. Uh, what is important that in, uh, in the core logs, uh, you can detect some organization of the, of the system with the more common and uh, very well eyes oriented large benthic foraminifera over here in the middle part and also in the upper part, and then some mixed part with uh, mostly abundant red algae and some large benthic foraminifera over here. And this is uh, related mainly to the density flow. And uh, here we have some large benthic uh, foraminifera predominant. And then uh, what is interesting is that uh, the resedimented components, large benthic foraminifera and red algae are mostly components from a bathymetric window only. So it means that we have not reworking of shallow water sediments. It means the, the shallowest part, the seagrass related phases are not reworked inside this part. So, this is, a, this is a problem because usually if you have like a storm events, if you have some storm return currents related to the surface storm, you rework also the shallowest part of the system. But if you rework only deep water or relatively deep water, I mean oligophotic zone, oh, there is my cat, is from here. Sorry. <laughs> and then. 
if you rework only the oligophotic zone over here, so you need an extra mechanism. The most uh, common mechanism that you can interpret in this way is the presence of internal waves breaking, they reworking the uh, red algae and the large benthic foraminifera, and then you have gravity flow that accumulate the sediments in the lower part. And in this way, you can explain the organization of this system. So, final remarks. Internal waves are as common as uh, surface waves in ocean and lakes and can occur at any depth. And the new cr criteria for recognition in sedimentary record are still to be developed. We didn't know everything. We have to, to study a lot to differentiate this kind of uh, mechanism. So, uh, they explain the episodic turbulence, we can have uh, up and down deep flow are characteristics of this kind of mechanism. They create alternation of bed load and suspension transport, remobilize sediments available at the internal waste breaking zone. Internal waste deposits are usually detached from shore related sediments, and the internal waste are particularly significant in carbonate system both in production and also in transport sediments because, oh, sorry, uh, because they are flux of nutrients uh, and plankton, food concentration and turbulence power suspension feeder metazoan may create stress or benefit in benthic communities. You remember the thermal effect uh, on the uh, corals. Large benthic foraminifera, red algae, and other kind of uh, biota, uh, the, the turbulence can determine the production and accumulation. And they can also explain why many carbonate systems develop in the mid rough setting, as we, we, we saw before. Okay, there are also some other, uh, some other uh, process to consider. What happens if we have the internal waves, the breaking, but in the same time we have some turbiditic flow that comes along the slope? So we don't know nothing about the potential sedimentary structures related to this kind of uh, two mechanisms, two uh, driving mechanisms. So Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, please, I'm, I'm here. To okay, thank these. you, Prof. Morsili, very interesting presentations. Thank you very much. And we already have many questioners here. Uh, the first one, uh, after I call your name, please tell me your background, yeah? Uh, which company or which university that you work in? or probably which country that you live currently. Okay, the first one is from Pak Budi, Budi Permana. You can turn on your audio, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Professor Michel. I have uh, two questions. Uh, first question is, uh, commonly we uh, identified our uh, depositional environment coming from uh, foraminifera uh, and then we can see, oh, okay, it deposited in, in, in certain uh, environment. So uh, with this case, like, like you presented that we can have like uh, internal wave that bring the deposition, the, the sediment from uh, the deeper part to the shallow part, uh, is there become a fitfall in uh, pa uh, paleo environment interpretation coming from the foraminifera? Uh, and then uh, the second one, uh, could you, uh, do you have any cases that, do we have a different uh, reservoir quality if we have a reef uh, or, or the coral built up in, in the photic zone and then uh, the, the, the coral that built or live uh, or constructed by the internal wave, uh, can we have like 
uh, the the comparison of the reservoir quality, which one is better, which one is worse, in term of uh, initial uh, pro property, uh, not not due to the the, the genesis or uh, some classification. That's the question from me. Uh, Greek, uh, thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you for your question. And uh, so the, the first part uh, that you have to consider that uh, in carbonates, uh, uh, the different components, uh, different kind of uh, foraminifera or other skeletal components, they can tell you the, uh, the light penetration zone. So you can infer if they are uh, living in the eophotic zone or in the meso-oligophotic. In, in this case, you have a powerful tool to consider. But the, the problem is that you, every time when you have loose sediments like uh, benthic foraminifera, they are not attached to the substrate, they can be transported. For this reason, this is important to consider if you have some phages related just to one palo depth window or light penetration window, or if they are mixed. When you have mixed sediments, they come from uh, euphotic zone, uh, oligophotic zone, or other deeper part. So maybe there are some transport mechanisms up here. And uh, so you have to be very careful in the interpretation uh, related to the biota, to the loose sediments. Of course, if you have some benthic or sessile community like the corals or stromatoporoids or other rudist whatever, so in that case, maybe it's, you can infer much more about the components because you know that they are not transported, they are in situ. I don't know if I'm answered to your questions, the first one. It's, it's okay, Professor. Okay, and the, the second uh, was related to the internal ways, uh, the difference in the system uh, and to the reservoir quality, if I'm correct. Uh, the second one is, uh, if we, uh, like you explained it, uh, even though it's in the mesopotic, uh, if uh, there is an, an internal wave, we can have uh, like a build up or a coral build up there. So yeah, I think because of that, uh, we can have like a, a reservoir uh, coming from the, the build up from the deeper uh, part of the ocean. So I just want to know if there is a, a difference in of quality. Uh, so in terms of exploration, if we found this kind of uh, coral, it will be it will have a good quality or bad quality, because if it is bad quality, maybe we need a bigger part, so it will be uh, economic. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, maybe I understood what you, what you mean. So, in, uh, in my opinion, the problem is this one. In the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, there are many papers that demonstrate that uh, corals can thrive also in the deep part, but also in the modern, there are many mesophotic coral communities. They are not very well known from uh, uh, geologists and sedimentologists, but if you ask to some uh, marine biologists, there are a lot of mesophotic coral communities, also in the modern. Eh? But uh, if we are studying the, in the past, uh, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous, uh, the Oligocene, uh, Eocene and whatever, where there are corals, uh, and uh, all the systems that we study, mostly this kind of uh, coral system are related to the meso to oligophotic zone and not in the uh, eophotic part, like in the modern. It seems that the corals uh, occupy uh, this uh, position only in the modern time, so at the end of the Miocene, in the last 10, 15 years ago. So, what is important for the exploration? First, you have to consider the time interval. This is uh, quite, uh, quite normal. And uh, 
in, in my opinion, is that if you have some mesophotic to oligophotic ribs, so the porosity is less than the modern coral ribs. When you have a lot of uh, dissolution, you have a lot of uh, energy. So usually the, the ribs that develop in, uh, in uh, meso to oligophotic zone uh, have much more muddy sediments, fine grain sediments inside. So for this reason, I think for in terms of exploration, maybe you have to consider that you don't have uh, any uh, vados uh, diagenesis dissolution. And uh, so that the, the primary porosity can be much lesser than the eophotic or modern coral reefs. Uh, it's answered my question. Grazie mille, professore. Prego, un piacere. Okay, thank you. The next one is from Pak Eri. Pak Eri Arifullah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the... It's good. Hello, Michelle. Hey, I'm here. Hi. Uh, I have read your paper about the internal waves versus surface storm wave in 2012 with Palmer. Yeah. Yeah, I am a ethnologist. Yeah, my uh, PhD research in Kutai Basin. Uh, we know the hammocky cross stratification is debatable. You know it, debatable. Hammocky cross stratification is deb debatable. Uh, by the way, how do we share uh, the hammocky cross stratification recognized is product of internal waves. This is the problem, I think. Because uh, in delta X systems such as uh, Kutai in Kutai Basin, I, I found much uh, hammocky cross stratification. So I don't know what the process is responsible. But uh, in consensus, Hamaki cross stratification is product of surface storm. This is the first my comment, or I don't know this question or comment. Uh, uh, in Kute, we have a carbonate sequence associated with pro, del pro deltaic system. Hence, uh, the carbonate is unique in, I, th I think, in Indonesia, in Kute Basin. I think the existence of the internal waves uh, will modify our interpretation before about the carbonate system. So what do you think about this, the, my second comment? Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to you. And uh, so I can answer to the first question, but to the second, because I don't know your basin uh, very well, so I cannot say too much. And uh, about the Amoki cross stratification. So uh, usually if you go in any test book of sedimentology, they say that the Amoki cross stratification is related to unidirectional flow and oscillatory flow. They have to act both together, okay? So, and this is okay because the, the storm and the currents associated to the storm, surface storm, can create this kind of uh, unidirectional and oscillatory flow. And this is normal. We, uh, if you read our paper, uh, uh, Morsili and Pomar 2012, uh, we say that uh, we don't exclude the possibility that, uh, 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 that storm waves can generate uh, Amoki cross stratification. So, but we, we consider other question that sometimes uh, the, we found uh, some we found. There are in the literature a lot of uh, examples where the Amoki are in a paleo depth much higher than the storm wave well, action. Okay. So this is one reason. Another reason is that uh, you have a lot of Amoki cross stratification, stratification described in lakes sequence. And in lakes, uh, you know that the, the waves are not very big like in the ocean. So for this reason, we start to try, but 
why we don't think uh, that uh, the internal waste can be another uh, alternative mechanism to create the amoki because they create unidirectional flow, they can scour, they can resuspend sedimentum, they create uh, uh, unidirectional currents, but also you have oscillatory flow in the same in time interval. So for this reason, we tried to explain uh, or make a, a different interpretation for the formation of the Amoki um, cross stratification. I don't know if I answer okay. correctly to your answer. Okay, uh, I know, Michel. Uh, I think uh, do you have experience to uh, to follow current analysis to differ between uh, internal waves and storm waves? Can you repeat, please? I didn't catch the uh, do you have uh, do you have experience uh, uh, doing uh, paleo current analysis to differ between uh, internal waves uh, product or storm waves product? Uh, so we have some um, some uh, uh, direct data about the, the the velocity and the currents induced by internal waves in the modern, but also from uh, surface wave from storm waves so and uh, the currents uh, are quite uh, similar uh, but in some cases okay. internal waves can create also stronger currents okay okay, okay thank you Michelle. <laughs> thank you you're welcome okay uh, is there any questions because that's this the last questions uh, because some some people are mistaken that this is the attendee list, list of attendee, but this is actually the list of Q&A, yeah? And is there any questions? If not, we can close these discussions. I will wait for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's dinner time, I think. I think it's dinner time, time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they are already hungry. <laughs> okay, I think that will be the end of our discussion. Um, okay, thank, thank you very thank much. You very much uh, on behalf of FOSI, um, Melinda, uh, and then we have Pak Erlangga and Trihandayani. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, sharing. This is very kind of you. And uh, next, if you have next uh, topic that you can uh, want to discuss with FOSI also, and yeah, yeah. we will be very happy to have you. Yeah, it will and be a pleasure. Also. Yeah. I, I hope the, the next time to be over there in uh, real, not virtually. <laughs> yeah, this is a very strange time to live in. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that's from me and uh, Melinda, the head of hospital. Do you have anything to add? Sorry, Melinda? Then? Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, Marcili, Melinda speaking over here. Uh, sorry Hi. for joining slightly late. I have another meeting this uh, still working from home. So that's why uh, many meetings uh, have been conducted today. Uh, thank you very much to you, especially uh, for this talk. Uh, so we are very glad to know that you share about carbonates because uh, um, our previous talk is not uh, catch so much about carbonate. Maybe uh, if you don't mind, we will invite you in another session for this uh, possible. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's would, all from me. Would Thank be you. A pleasure. Very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. See you again. Yeah. See you, everyone. Yeah. Happy yeah. weekend. Then happy weekend. Yeah. See you. Okay, stay safe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nice to you. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah.